Chapter 10, Saturday, April 7th, 1984. With both hands, Rachel Varney shoved her headphones against her ears, which did little to drown out Cliff, Mom's boyfriend. He'd spent the morning complaining about the Mormon conference being on TV. Then, when the Tabernacle Choir came on to sing, he turned it up and mocked it with his own drunken operatic howling. Rachel, therefore, turned up Cruel Summer by Bananarama, a song Bogey would never have approved of, but then Bogey could take his tough music and shove it where the sun didn't shine. Cruel Summer had become her song when someone at the Valley View Drive-In had pulled up in a convertible alongside her family car. She asked the lady in the convertible who sang it. She said it was a bootleg from Great Britain. Something about it touched her deeply, and it stayed in her mind, even as she had to watch a movie from the back seat through Cliff's dark Coors bottles and Mom's cigarette smoke. Perhaps the long, intolerably hot summer, lying in her room, the swamp cooler not working, no boyfriend to spend time with, except for Bogey, who was a good kisser, but way too similar to Cliff personality-wise for her to want to get emotionally involved with him, was what drew her to the song's message. Cliff's howling came closer. Rachel eyed her open window and waited. Maybe he wouldn't bug her, but lately, with Mom working all the time, Rachel had begun to detest being alone with him in the house. She hit the stop button to her Sony Walkman and listened. He was across the hall in the bathroom. By the sound of his piss pouring into the toilet, he hadn't bothered to close the door. She grimaced, then pressed rewind. She'd spent hours sitting by the radio, recording her favorite songs on an old tape. She had a few from The Beatles, Loverboy, Journey, Air Supply, but mostly new singles like Time After Time by Cyndi Lauper, Hold Me Now by the Thompson Twins, and a bunch more of which she wasn't sure of the artist. The mechanical whine of the rewinding tape became the only sound beside her breath and the distant television. She hadn't heard Cliff leave the bathroom and go back to the living room to swear and yell hallelujah and praise the Lord over the Mormon apostles, who sounded to Rachel like nice old grandpas. If he hated the Mormon television show so bad, why didn't he just change channels and look for his holy football? She sat quietly up. A shadow at the crack under the door was enough evidence he hadn't left. Coldness poured into her chest. Moving quickly but carefully, she grabbed her jacket and tiptoed to the window. Whatever business he thought he had standing in front of her door, she wasn't about to find out. Maneuvering so she could drop feet first, she slid over the window sill, which scraped against her stomach, then let go and hit the ground running. When she slipped through the opening in the fence, two boards wide, probably missing since the seventies, she looked back. Cliff stood at her window. Get out of my room, asshole. Shirtless and holding a beer. The reject raised his bottle in salute and disappeared into the shadows of the house. Coldness in her chest burst into a hot and focused flame. Either he goes, or I go. Mom kept saying she would leave him, but never did. Even after Rachel cried to her, telling her Cliff gave her the creeps, that her underwear kept turning up missing in the laundry, that she didn't like the way he stared at her when Mom wasn't looking, and that she couldn't shower when he was awake because he always happened to be close by when she came out. Worst of all, he'd lost his job again, so that meant it would be Rachel and Cliff alone together while Mom was slaving at the warehouse during the week and waiting tables on the weekends. Heading west along a rain-moistened sidewalk, she glanced back, her house disappearing behind the trees. She felt as if she could keep walking all the way to California, where she supposedly had family, but she couldn't say exactly where because she hadn't visited them since she was little, and Mom never talked to Grandma. Rachel imagined leaving town and hitchhiking the lonely desert highways, but the image of a guy like Cliff pulling over to give her a ride shattered the romantic vision. No matter how she played it out, over and over again, one cliff after another would pull over. Cliff in a tie. Cliff in a truck. A gross, bald, fat cliff. Cliff with a mustache. Cliff with a beard. Cliff in a wide-collar shirt, unbuttoned, and his sweaty chest hair curling like a thousand tiny worms. Always an older cliff. Hating men, she cried and raked her knuckles across a chain-link fence, provoking a stupid dog into hysterics.
Saturday morning cartoons had long since lost their luster for Donnie, whose parents were too poor to afford cable TV, therefore no MTV. Brand new kid video seemed interesting the first morning it was on. The main girl cute in a phony sort of way, but the new wave and top 40 music quickly became too much to bear. Dungeons and Dragons was the only cartoon that seemed to have merit, but it had been bumped for Saturday Supercade. Sorry, Donkey Kong was fun as a video game, but not as a cartoon. He'd seen all the Johnny Quest episodes ten times over and had lost interest in the other Hanna-Barbera shows, especially the Smurfs. That stupid theme song, la 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 la, stuck in his head. So he sneaked into his parents' cluttered bedroom, found his dad's pile of change, and ditched the apartment for something better to do. He stood in cool, overcast light against the brick wall outside Safeway, sipping an RC cola and savoring a fruit pie. Not the best choice of breakfast, but by far the most enjoyable. Nancy Nash's heavily shadowed portrait, Xeroxed on a flyer taped to the entrance, stared at him each time the door opened. But it was an empty stare that made him feel sad. He tried to imagine those pretty eyes, full of emotion and intelligent, looking into his, communicating special things words couldn't. The door swung away, taking the fantasy with it. Nancy had been missing several days since Donnie had last seen her, so naturally he had the ongoing attention of both the police and the Nashes. A Lady Momney was already spreading rumors that Nancy had been kidnapped by a pervert, something that caused Donnie to wonder if they thought he was the one, that he'd done something to her and was under tacit suspicion. He chewed the last piece of apple filling and crust and chased it with a long burning swig of cola, let a hot burp proudly ring across the parking lot, then walked the trail through the alfalfa field to Brockbank Junior High. As he reached the gate in the fence, he thought straight ahead, south, to the church grounds would be the direction of the day, but his feet deviated, taking him in a westerly direction. His mind elsewhere, he corrected himself twice, only to discover he'd moved on an angle, as if the earth underneath him had tipped. Instead of reaching the church grounds, he reached the tree where Bogey had lent him the Iron Maiden tape. The breeze hissed like a thousand dying breaths. The skin on his arms and neck tightened to goose flesh. A mild fuzziness settled over his mind. His attention turned to the big white sea painted on the mountain above the Kennecott power station. The breeze became a tug, almost a ticklish desire to walk to the flumes. But having last seen Nancy there haunted him as much as having seen her naked, the part he wished he hadn't told anyone. He let the feeling carry him another block to the high school. The new shiny windows looked dark, sleepy. He thought of ghost stories he had heard about the old building. Since the gym and swimming pool were still there, he reasoned ghosts might have managed to ride out the construction by hanging around other parts of campus. The breeze came back, and with it the feeling to keep moving. It wasn't so much a desire, but a push and a pull, a conflict. Another feeling deeper and more trustworthy whispered he'd gone far enough. Less than a block away, the parking lot by the gym had cars, so Donnie thought the high school might not be closed after all. Maybe the pool still had Saturday open plunge. If not, he could slip in and see if the swim team was practicing. Some of the girls were cute. The image of Nancy lying on the ground under a cascade of blossoms flashed through his mind like a slap, carrying a message not of words but of feelings. He would see her again. She would be at the flumes naked, waiting for a hero to save her. This time she wouldn't run. His feet shifted on the corner of the sidewalk, making a sound like rubbing sandpaper under his shoes. A surprisingly loud sound that brought awareness of how peculiarly quiet the morning was. Before stepping off the curb, he turned and glimpsed a van drift by the other street, the same van that had parked near the Nash house the day he saw Nancy. It slowed down, and he thought the driver, no more than a pair of dark glasses in the shadows, might have looked his direction. Feeling chills, he pulled his collar tighter, stepped off the curb, and walked to the swimming pool. A little boy with wet hair carrying a rolled towel ran out of the entrance and startled Donnie. 
A woman's voice rang out from around the corner. Wait up! The boy halted. A faded image of an orange Dodge Charger, the General Lee from the Dukes of Hazard, unfurled onto the sidewalk as he dropped his towel. A wet pair of trunks and some Return of the Jedi underoos tumbled after it. That's why I told you to wait up, the woman said. The boy stood over his towel, looking as if he was on the verge of crying. What caught Donnie's attention wasn't the boy's towel and the other things that the woman proceeded to pick up, but the boy's shirt. On it was a bright, glossy image of sunlight cutting through trees and shattering into a thousand winking dots of light that stretched over a field in a luminous, galloping white horse. A feeling of longing for that scene came so powerfully that it caused Donnie to pause and wonder if such a place really existed. He felt as if it did. Through the entrance and straight to the open ticket office, the humidity and smell intensified. Just as he'd hoped, a pretty girl worked the till. The stretchy fabric of her swimsuit conformed well to her soft, slender curves. Her feathered, chlorine-bleached hair gave her the Farrah Fawcett look. Definitely a senior. Flash Dance, What a Feeling by Irene Cara played in the background. Careful not to stare, Donnie looked over the rack of chicka sticks, candy necklaces, sugar daddies, pop rocks, atomic fireballs, now and laters, and hubba bubba bubble gum. What did the gum fighter in the commercial say? The new nerds, candies, and by the time he chose the chicka stick and handed over his twenty cents, Mr. Roboto by Sticks had begun to play. Are you swimming today? the girl asked, her words nearly masked by the sounds of echoing voices and showers from the locker rooms. No, I'm just going to the galley. Then you have to go around, she said coldly, her brown eyes moving past him to the next customer. Donnie decided she wasn't as pretty as he thought. She was also a KRSPAM listener. He left her to the other customers and slipped into the hallway. Around the corner he found a shadowy corridor that separated the boys' gym from the pool. To his left was the galley door. Locked. Stupid girl. The corridor ended in a split between an exit and a flight of stairs that led to the upper bleachers above the gym. Tossing and catching the chicka stick, he walked the length of the hall and imagined himself, next year, as a high school student with a car and a girlfriend. Dim light barely penetrated the window above the stairwell. A lower flight led to a weight room in the basement. He stared into the blackness and thought of ghosts again. He backed away, feeling uneasy, and took the upper flight, where he could look out the window. His shoes clicked over the old red tile. The big white sea on the mountain peak above Kennecott stood out like a beacon. Below it were the flumes. She's waiting for you. A storm of chills passed up his back and tightened around his neck like hands. The only sounds besides his breathing were the distant echoes from the pool, yet he felt as if terrible things would appear from the shadows, things that would whisper his name and smile as Donnie screamed. A strange van turned onto the street between the church and the football field. He watched it approach the school, slowing down in intervals, as if the driver was looking for someone. It bypassed the construction zone and disappeared somewhere close. He thought it must have stopped because there wasn't an outlet and it hadn't turned around. A minute or two passed as Donnie became aware of his own breathing and a ringing in his ears. He slowly descended the stairs until he could see the entrance. A shadow moved, as if someone pressed against the glass to look in. Donnie inched his way down to get a better look. A hand, crowned in copper and silver bracelets, gripped the door handle. The door clicked. Locked. Relieved, Donnie bypassed the last few steps to leap over the railing. As he rounded the corner, he glimpsed a face, sunglasses removed, revealing dark, gypsy-like eye makeup. Hello? A woman's smoke-scratchy voice seemed muted and lifeless through the glass. Not waiting to see what she wanted, he went the other way, down the hall. A light from the open dance studio across from the pool caught his attention. Drill team girls, the spinnakers, sat on the shiny honey-colored wood floor. One of them, slender in her team sweats, jumped up, hair bouncing, and ran to a stereo kept in a closet. Donnie tiptoed past the door so as not to be seen. Ticks and scratches of a record being cued on a record player blasted over speakers, 
and then the clear but muted guitar picking of the intro to Every Breath You Take by the police. He thought of dates and cars and felt lonely. Outside, he watched for the van. When he was sure it was gone, he walked toward the tennis courts. A noisy flock of birds lifted at once from a giant elm across the street, as if at a single mysterious signal. They swooped and twisted in an order only they understood. Donnie felt as though a light had suddenly flashed over the mysteries of life, come and gone like headlight glare across the wall in the night. And with it, for an instant, the image of school kids his age, talking, mingling, joining, separating, flowing, thousands of them, millions of them, all following some preordained order in the universe. Like standing at the door to the dance studio, he was on the outside looking in, even at the very edge of his own existence. Where the building ended, he took the concrete stairs to a lower patio area, then walked through the covered alley between the ice skating rink and the pool. A girl, silhouetted against the bright football field, leaned on a chain-link fence post. Donnie hung his head low to pass her, unnoticed, he thought. But then she spoke. What you doing? He jerked his head up, unsure if she was talking to him. Rachel, slipping her headphones from her ears and letting them hang on her neck like a necklace, smiled. Donnie stopped, then grinned, and rolled his eyes in his mistake of not recognizing her. Rachel reached out and gave him a hug. No way! Like, what are the chances you'd come through right here, right now? I mean, no way! She smelled like a mixture of shampoo and cigarette smoke. I don't know. I guess I'm just here. Yeah, she said, lifting her hair away from the headphones so it wouldn't get caught. What are you listening to, Donnie asked, not knowing what else to say. Total eclipse of the heart. Donnie thought of the radio station he hated and snickered. Rachel didn't seem to notice or didn't care. Either way, she said, I love that song. They walked together onto the track around the football field. But have you seen the video? It's the creepiest freaking video ever. I guess I haven't. It's like their eyes glow, you know, possessed. Sounds killer. Totally. The van appeared below the northern slope of campus. Hey, come here, fast, Donnie said, pointing to football bleachers. Relieved she caught on so quickly, he led her to a cement wall and chain-link fence at the corner of the bleachers. She hunched down next to him. What are you looking at? Check it out. He moved aside so she could get a better view. The van crested the slope and stopped at the entrance to the track. The strange woman got out, shielded her eyes from the sun with her hand, and looked over the football field. Do you know her? Donnie asked. I don't think so. I've seen her around, the van and all. Wasn't she at the Nash's house the other day? Donnie narrowed his eyes. Yeah, it's like she stared at me there, you know. She's following me or something. Why don't you ask her what she wants? She's probably a psycho. Donnie moved farther into the human shadows under the bleachers. Pigeons cooed. Rachel tightened her jacket against the cold breeze. Tinny music from her headphones, like a miniature orchestra, sounded loud in the echoing concrete space. Rachel smiled. Everybody thinks I'm a psycho, and you don't have a problem talking to me. <laughs> Whatever. When they finally wandered to the north end of the bleachers, Donnie poked his head out. Rachel followed him into the sun. The van was gone. See what I mean, Donnie asked? I guess that is a little weird. As they walked toward the neighborhoods, Donnie kept his eye out. Cottonwoods thinly greening filled the sky. The expanse of campus stretched to the east, partially obscured by the shop building. Feeling that the campus had lost its charm, Donnie asked, So what are you doing today? His attention drifted in the direction of the flumes. Rachel, still glancing around, shrugged and said, Nothing? Anything? Donnie smiled. Letting his feet take him in the direction of the church across the street, he said, Me too. He felt Rachel catch up, and how her friendly companionship easily showed as she matched his stride. Her music drifted around them, sometimes disappearing in the breeze. Then he caught a distinct melody, something that rose like a series of hills, and he felt it more than heard it. Every once in a while a song struck him, magically, sparking fires inside and making him want to sing along. 
What are you listening to now? Making love out of nothing at all. Air supply. I like it. I guess you probably think I'm weird, but I want to hear it again. She immediately stopped the tape and pressed rewind. Concentration showed on her face. She played with the buttons until she had the song exactly at the beginning. Then she slipped off her headphones. She detached one of the tiny speakers from the headband and handed it to Donnie. Check this out. They leaned against each other, Rachel with one speaker over her right ear and Donnie with the other speaker over his left ear. Their shoulders pressed and their heads nearly collided. Rachel softly sang along with the words, her gaze in a way turning inward, though staring at some distant point far ahead. You know, it makes you wonder. Listening, Donnie moved his head. Her words trailed off, and he waited for her to finish. She smiled and looked away. What? Donnie asked. Nothing. Never mind. All right. Donnie shrugged. Magna's Main Street came closer with every step. Bill's lounge appeared to their right. He'd heard stories about the place, which had a mysterious reputation with kids his age. Stories about women dancing in the buff. And whether that was true or not, he wouldn't find out for many more years, if ever. Grandma told him about businesses that came and went, like Cypress Drug after the pharmacist was killed in a botched robbery attempt. But Bill's lounge seemed eternal, a part of Main Street, a part of the solid, real, unchanging world that held Donnie in, much like the mountain ranges overlooking the valley and the massive swaying elms shading the neighborhoods. Rachel spoke. I mean love. The song ended. Donnie handed back the speaker. Rachel expertly reattached it, then said, Does a love like that really exist, where two people know each other so well it seems it's nothing at all? Donnie shrugged and swallowed. I'd like to believe it does, Rachel continued. You know, Bogey once told me he loved me. She stared at the ground. Ahead, a van turned the corner, but not the weird lady's van. Donnie let out a breath and admired an old Mustang parked in a driveway overgrown with paradise trees. If that's what they were really called. After a stretch of silence that lasted more than half a block, Donnie asked in a quiet voice, Do you love him? Sometimes I think I do. Does he love you? Donnie wanted to ask, but the words couldn't pass the knot in his throat. They wandered, carried in a thin haze of music, and the farther west they traveled, the more Donnie felt the strange pull in the direction of the flumes, past the Gem Theater, past Falvo Sporting Goods, past Colossimo's Market, until they reached Dyke's Rexel Drug Store. Let's go in here, Rachel said, tugging Donnie's arm. He let her take him through the door, but not without a reluctant look to where the street ended against the foothills. Inside, he followed her past five-and-dime merchandise to the counter where fountain drinks were sold. A couple of old men sat on stools and sipped coffee. I'm thirsty. Do you want something? Rachel asked. Nah, I'm good. But in reality, he thought he could use another RC Cola. Sprite, please, she said, to a man wearing a white apron. He smiled and filled a styrofoam cup with ice and Sprite. Donnie overheard one of the old men next to him speaking in a rough voice. Blackballed him, the Union. He was going around telling everyone we was infiltrated by communists. I was afraid it wouldn't be long before he had an accident. The other old man grunted and stared into his cup. The speaker continued. To tell you the truth, I think it had everything to do with a council dispute. They put his wife out of business at the hair salon and denied water rights to his son when he bought the property below the canal. Sadlers had that property and never had no trouble getting water. You tell me. I swear it's that council. Got their dirty fingers in everything. They support the unions, you know. Copper market's going down. They'll stir things up, blame the company when they'll have to adjust. Another grunt. Rachel sat her cup down. I think this place is so cute. It's so fifties, you know. You've seen those old pictures and films of the guy and the girl, each with a straw, sharing a malt? That's so romantic. I wanted Bogey to do it with me. He wouldn't. Said it was gross. I'd backwash. Can you believe that? He never has a problem kissing, but couldn't share a malt with me? Go figure. 
The little change Donnie had left felt light in his pocket. He looked up at the malt prices, then to Rachel, who rested her chin on her hand and seemed to stare at a box of napkins. He almost told her he'd share a malt with her, if she paid for it, then thought otherwise. Instead, he swiped a straw when the man behind the counter wasn't looking, and then carefully tore off the end of the paper wrapper. After working with it for a few seconds, he carefully glanced at Rachel, slipped the uncovered end into his mouth, and then blew. The paper wrapper flew like a dart into her hair. Rachel jumped, surprised. You dipstick! For a moment, Donnie thought she was angry, until she took the wrapper, tore off a piece, rolled it up into a little ball, stuffed it in the end of her own straw, pointed it at Donnie's face, then blew. Donnie ducked and laughed. They both raced for another unopened straw sitting a few feet away, reaching and simultaneously slapping their hands on it. Donnie felt it slip between his fingers. Ah, dang! Rachel hopped off her stool, fingers working quickly, and Donnie snatched a napkin and went to work arming his own straw. Hiding behind a display of greeting cards, Rachel was the first to fire back. Her little paper pellet sailed high and bounced off a pillar. Donnie glanced at the man behind the counter, who didn't yet seem to notice them playing around in his store, or didn't care. Donnie hunched down like a soldier and scurried behind another counter, then shot at Rachel, who let out a tiny playful scream and ducked. An old gray woman pushing a walker came through the door, and both Donnie and Rachel straightened up, holding back laughs, and paused to let her pass. She approached the pharmacist's window, and a smiling young woman appeared, first attending to the old woman, then glaring at Donnie, who suddenly darted behind another shelf. Hey! The man at the counter stepped into the aisle. You kids can be here, but only on your best behavior. Still laughing, Rachel appeared from behind a pillar. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Donnie said, but not letting down his guard. Face red, he met Rachel in the aisle. The two of them exchanged looks and shared a silent laugh. As they headed for the door, Donnie overheard the old man at the counter. Union ain't going to let Kennegott renegotiate. They'll hang on till everyone's laid off. All these guys with families, who's looking out for them? Johnson was right about them commies. They'll kill this town. I swear the town's cursed. Sometimes I wonder if there ain't something else going on beneath the surface, because things just don't make sense sometimes. The man's words caused Donnie to pause and listen for more. But, except for a low grumble of an answer from the other man leaning over his coffee, the conversation, one-sided, died away. Then Donnie felt a hissing blast of air in his ear. He spun in time to see Rachel dart away, laughing with a straw in her mouth. He chased her out the door. She was ready for him around the corner and gave him another blast from the straw. He blew back. She screamed and ducked. He swiped for her straw, and she continued to evade him. Okay, I give, she said, taking the straw out of her mouth. They both lost interest in the game and slowed down when they reached the street corner. The last block of Main Street, paint flaking and dried up like the skin around a wound, seemed to subtly affect both their moods. Donnie paused to press his face against a vacant store window. Rachel looked around. This place is depressing, she said. You want to see something cool? Donnie asked. He felt the urge to take her by the hand, but didn't. Instead, he walked toward the flumes. I guess, she said but her voice had lost its enthusiasm. The closer they came to the opening in the fence, the faster Donnie walked. He felt the urge to run and was frustrated as Rachel slowed down. Come on, it's through here, he said, waving her in. The cold, muddy trail seemed untouched as he ducked through and headed for the trees. She's here. What do you think? Rachel did her best to catch up, she walked through the new moist grass to avoid the mud, and her shoes quickly became soaked. It's all right, I guess. The trees grew thicker the farther they went along the canal. The sound of water falling led Donnie to the pool. Rachel struggled behind him as she couldn't avoid the mud any longer. I'm ruining my shoes. Over here, he said, and left the trail. Rachel paused to look at water cascading from the man-made waterfall. Blossoms floated on a murky pool. A cool breeze brought tiny drops of rain. She thought how badly life would suck if it began to pour. Forcing herself to move, she caught up with Donnie, and they ducked through some shrubs to a spot that seemed terribly lonely, yet terribly beautiful at the same time. 
This is where I found her, Donnie said, looking around. I'm cold, Rachel said. She rubbed her arms. Donnie didn't seem to hear her. He walked to the edge of the little meadow, then pushed his way into more trees. Rachel watched him go, feeling strange, as if they weren't alone. She looked around. Donnie, wait. She stepped over a fallen tree. When she could no longer see him, a creeping uneasiness changed to fear. For a moment she felt as if Donnie hadn't been there at all, that he'd been a figment of her imagination, or that she'd followed an apparition into this strange and lonely place only to be abandoned and left vulnerable. Vulnerable to what? Donnie, wait! She found where he'd entered the trees, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen. More raindrops came in with the wind. She shivered and angrily regretted letting him lead her there. Damn it, Donnie, where are you? Over here. His distant voice echoed back. Where? She couldn't see anything but trees that went on as if for miles. When they'd entered, the flumes hadn't looked any larger than a clump of woods between town and the foothills. If she was looking in the right direction, she would have seen where the trees ended. The mountains, shrouded in heavy rain clouds, had all but disappeared. She fought to keep her bearings. I'm getting pissed! Twigs cracked unnervingly under her feet. She pushed aside one branch, then another. When she reached a boggy spot, she turned and retraced her steps. She thought she should have reached the small clearing. Donnie? Movement caught her attention. A doe lifted its head from the scrub and stared at Rachel. Its dark eyes, alert and wide, fixed on her, its ears perked. Rachel gasped in delight. A strange distant sound floated on the wind, and the doe's attention shifted. Rachel quickly turned around. The doe fled, bounding deeper into the woods. Rachel thought the sound she heard might have been a howling dog. Its mournful wail became dreadful. When she turned back around, she screamed. Donnie stood behind her as if appearing from nowhere. What? Damn it, you scared the shit out of me. Where did you go? Right here. What's the matter? Go to hell, she said, and stomped past him. I want to go back. How do we get back? Hold on. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to scare you. Well, you sure did a good job of it. I think the trail's this way, Donnie said, taking a different direction. It better be. Rachel followed him. The trees sloped into another boggy area, causing them to stop and look around. Oh, great, now we're really lost, Rachel said. I swear it was this way. Donnie's sincerity unnerved her even worse. When she folded her arms and glared at him, he looked away, hurt. I'm sorry, I thought. The sound returned, closer this time. Donnie's eyes widened. Did you hear that? No shit, Sherlock. The hurt in his eyes deepened. He set his jaw and started walking a different direction. She felt as if she had no other choice but to follow him. He occasionally looked back in the direction the sound had come from. She couldn't help but do the same. She saw nothing but trees. Then something very large passed overhead. Wow, Donnie said. What was that? Rachel grabbed his arm. I don't know. Could have been a glider, maybe. She stared at him then said, Yeah, maybe. They passed through more scrub and finally found the trail in the canal. When she stepped onto the trail, she felt as if something had changed. It was so subtle that it could have been the air or the sounds of the falling water and the birds, but any other time she would have dismissed it. Let's go back, I'm cold, she said, taking the lead. When they passed their own footprints where they'd entered the trees, she noticed Donnie looked hurt, or maybe just distracted or disappointed. After a quiet moment, she asked, did you think you'd see her again? I don't know, he said, and stared into the distance. More rain came, and she pulled her collar tighter. The trees ended. Misty foothills sloped toward the town. A horn from a train blared mournfully from the direction of Kennecott. They reached the fence, and he paused to help her through. I don't know what I was thinking, he said. <laughs>